All right, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Hopsteiner webinar speaker series, Hoppy Topics. My name is Darren and I'm part of the success team here at Hopsteiner. The Hopsteiner webinar speaker series, Hoppy Topics, is a free online educational seminar with presentations from our lead researchers and hop scientists. I will host a new speaker with me here every Tuesday throughout the month of June to keep you up to date on industry trends and helpful insights. We hope these presentations help bring supportive inspiration to your lives and your craft. Each presentation was created to address hop-related challenges brewers face on a daily basis, and we hope their latest discoveries help you in your quest to brew better beer. Before I introduce you to our guest speakers, everyone should know that comments and questions are absolutely welcome. Each will be addressed at the end of the webinar using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens. A link with each webinar recording will be available on our website under the online customer portal page shortly after each presentation. Simply sign up on our website to watch or download. Here with us today is Dr. John Paul May, Technical Director of Product Development at, Hop at Hopsteiner, excuse me, along with our questions moderator, Mike Sutton, Vice President of Craft Sales. Dr. May started his work as a hop chemist in 1993 and has since developed numerous patented hop-related products used throughout the brewing industry today. Most of Dr. May's latest work focuses on downstream hop products, a topic Dr. May is looking forward to discussing with us today. Dr. May, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Darren. And with that, um, let's start. Um, today's talk again is on advanced hop products, when and where to use them. Before we start though, I'd just like to uh, make a couple comments about uh, our Hopsteiner organization. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Hopsteiner is an international hop company. Uh, we have two ma major manufacturing facilities, uh, one in Yakima, Washington, and the other in Mainburg, Germany. And for those who don't know, the United States last year grew about 40% of the world's hops and Germany grew about 37% of the world's hops. So 75% of the hops being grown around the world are in these two uh, major hop growing countries. Uh, hop Center also has facilities uh, in the UK, uh, in uh, some of the Czech uh, growing hop regions, also in Spain, uh, China, and then we have affiliates uh, in other hop growing areas like in Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, Argentina, et cetera. So if there's a hop variety uh, that you're interested in that's international, you can contact us and uh, we'd be able to uh, obtain that for you. So <clears throat> when it comes to hop products, we have our conventional hop products, which are leaf hops, hop pellets, and uh, CO2 hop extract. We also have uh, pre-isomerized products, and these are separated by the products that are isomerized and added to the kettle, and those uh, added uh, post-fermentation. And I'll talk about these uh, in more detail later. And then the specialty hop products are our oil products, and these are the steam distilled, uh, thin film, as well as our uh, beta aroma extract and aroma extract. So the goal uh, to making these specialty hop products is to start with CO2 hop extract. Uh, this beautiful picture you see here uh, is uh, under a magnifying uh, a magnoscope and uh, those are the lupulin glands. So the lupulin glands within hops uh, retain the key essential oils and hop bitter acids. So when we extract hops with CO2, the process starts, of course, with baled hops, but then the bales go through a bale breaker and, and a hammer mill, and then that hop powder is, uh, goes through a, uh, a pelleting mill to make hop pellets. The reason we pelletize hops prior to CO2 extraction is that only about maybe 10 to 20% of the lupulin gland in bales are broken, uh, but when we pelletize 100%, of the lupulin glands are broken. So this allows a more efficient extraction of the key ingredients in the hops. The other reason we also pelletize is when we pelletize, we increase the bulk density, which means we can put more hops in our extraction uh, column, okay? So once the hops are loaded in this extraction column, we have a CO2 reservoir tank 
which uh, goes through a high pressure pump because we're doing supercritical CO2 extraction, which is high pressure and high temperature. And it goes through a heat exchanger to get the, temp the CO2 to the temperature we want for extraction. And then that high pressure CO2 uh, goes through our extraction column and then goes through uh, this evaporator. And what the evaporator does, it actually, it's a pressure release uh, uh, mechanism. So the pressure is dropped. The CO2 or the hop extract comes out of solution, falls out of the CO2. And then the CO2 gas goes through this uh, condenser where it's chilled and then sent back into our reservoir tank. And this process goes on and on until all the ingredients of interest are extracted. So what is CO2 extract used for? It's used primarily for bittering. So you can replace hop pellets with CO2 hop extract. Uh, the hop varieties that are typically extracted with carbon dioxide are high alpha acid varieties. Because again, that's high alpha acid varieties are primarily used for bittering. And so as a result, CO2 extract is, uh, we usually use our high alpha acid varieties. Now CO2 hop extract has many, many benefits. Um, uh, one, for example, is we can actually package uh, the extract into tins like these based on the alpha content. So if you're adding 150 grams of alpha to, a, to your brew kettle, we can package 150 grams of alpha into a tin. And we can go all the way up to about, I believe, uh, 1,000 grams of alpha per tin. And if you need larger packaging, we can package in drums or five-gallon pails, uh, et cetera. Another benefit to CO2 hop extract, especially for some craft brewers, is there's no vegetative matter. So that means you're not going to be adding leaf material, which can absorb and reduce beer yield. CO2 extract also does not add to the trub, and uh, it's very easily used by warming up and uh, to, to liquefy it and, and pour it right into the uh, right into the brew kettle. Other benefits are storage stability. The product is very stable at room temperature, so you don't need expensive refrigeration temperature storage. Um, and also shipping. You're shipping a lot less material and you're storing a lot less material. And it's very easy to use and it's very, very stable. Another new product we've come out with recently is Hop Flow. Uh, this is CO2 hop extract in which we've removed uh, most of the beta acids. Uh, beta acids have a very high melting point, and uh, that's why a CO2 hop extract is very thick and usually a solid at room temperature. So by removing the beta acids, we can make a very flowable uh, uh, hop extract. Again, it would be used in the same way as CO2 hop extract. Uh, it's made from high alpha acid varieties. Uh, the alpha concentration is higher than that of CO2 hop extract, usually about 65 to 75%. Uh, it's also enriched in oil. The oil content is about 12 to 18 grams per 100 grams of extract. Again, no vegetative matter, no addition to the trub. And uh, again, it allows for flexible dosing. Uh, if you want to use partial container, you can, or you can pour the whole thing in. Um, and again, it has the same benefits. It's very stable, takes up less uh, space, and uh, very easy to use. Well, now I'll start talking about some of our uh, <clears throat> specially hot products, uh, alpha extract. What is alpha extract? Alpha extract is simply a 20% solution of alpha acids formulated as a potassium salt in water. Alpha extract contains no hop oil, it contains no beta acids. And so uh, one of the things uh, we discovered at Hop Center a few years ago was that alpha acids, when added to beer post-fermentation, can enhance the foam and lacing of beer. Now we have another foam enhancing hop product, which I'll talk about later, uh, which is Tetra. And Tetra was our primary foam enhancing hop product, but the challenge with Tetra is it contributes bitterness, all right? And so the nice thing about alpha acids is alpha acids are only about one-tenth as bitter as isoalpha acids. So if you're adding five ppm 
or 10 ppm of alpha acids to your beer, you're not going to be contributing any bitterness. So it's really a nice product to add to low IBU beers to enhance the foam and lacing of their beers. Now we'll talk about some of our isomerized uh, products. Um, we'll talk about first our isomerized kettle products and then our isomerized uh, downstream post-fermentation hop products. I think most people are familiar with the fact that when hops are boiled in the brew kettle, the alpha acids undergo a thermal isomerization to form isoalpha acids. And it's the isoalpha acids that gives beer its bitterness. Now, because the pH of the wort is on the acidic side, the efficiency for isomerization is quite low. In baled hops, it's only about 25% of the alpha acids ends up as isoalpha acids in the beer. Hop pellets a little bit better, it's 30%. And CO2 hop extract, it's about 35%. However, in our downstream plant, uh, what we can do is add CO2 hop extract to a tank uh, of water, add some potassium hydroxide to increase the pH to about eight and a half to 10. And by heating that solution up, we can isomerize virtually 95%, if not more, of the alpha acids into isoalpha acids. So the first two uh, isomerized kettle products I'm gonna talk about is Ike and Pike. Ike stands for isomerized kettle extract and Pike stands for the potassium salt of isomerized kettle extract. These products are, again are usually added in the kettle um, and uh, again, allow to have superior utilization. You can get efficiencies as high as 50% uh, adding these products, meaning that 50% of the isoalpha acids in these products will get into the final beer. Pike is often used by brewers in higher altitudes where maybe the boiling point isn't quite 100 degrees. And so, uh, as a potassium salt, the pike uh, goes into solution quite readily. And so uh, doesn't need a lot of time for it to go in. But again, like uh, you could add these products either at the beginning of the boil, if you do not want any of the hop oil uh, in these products, or you can add them at the end of the boil if you want to retain uh, the hop oils in these products. They're very effective in high gravity beers and high IBU beers. Again, like CO2 hop extract, there's no vegetative material. So you get good beer yields. Uh, the product could be warmed to 120 degrees C to get it liquefied. And again, it has all the same benefits as CO2 hop extract when it comes to stability, uh, storage temperature, and handling. The uh, next uh, isomerized kettle extract product that we make is a light stable isomerized kettle extract that we call Liskey. Okay. Uh, what we do here to make Liskey is we actually first make Ike and then we're able to isolate the isoalpha acids in the Ike product and then we treat it with sodium borohydride to reduce the isoalpha acids to make what we call rho isoalpha acids. And then we add that rho back to the beta acid and hop oil from that Ike product. And so basically what we're making here is a Ike product that's been reduced. So it's light stable. So you can use it to make light stable beers, but a lot of craft brewers and large brewers that use this product like it for its smooth bitterness. Some of you who may have heard me talk about humulinones as having a smooth bitterness. Well, that's exactly what Rho is. It has that same smooth bitterness as humulinones. In fact, as a side note, uh, a few months ago, we took uh, two bottles of unhopped beer and we spiked one with 20 parts per million of humulinone and the other one with 20 parts per million of Rho isoalpha acids. And when our sensory panel tasted these beers, everyone thought they tasted identical. I mean, you couldn't really differentiate the two. So if you're looking for a nice, smooth tasting bitterness 
uh, I re uh, recommend you to look at our row products. Again, the efficiency is very high, about 50% of the row ice alpha acid uh, added to the kettle gets into the final beer. Uh, again, the product can be used uh, to make light stable beer. And if that's the case, you wanna make sure that you use yeast that was not exposed to ice alpha acids. And you also wanna make sure that the tanks and the lines that were used to make an ISO beer have been cleaned very, very well to ensure there's no trace amounts of ice alpha acids uh, in your uh, in your tank or, uh, or, or lines or pumps. Uh, we found that uh, as little as a 0.1 part per million of ice alpha acid in the beer can become can make the beer light struck or get skunky. So again, the product has the same benefits as CO2 hop extract, again, in terms of handling, stability, and uh, storage. So when comparing uh, CO2 hop extract to uh, Liskey, again, uh, CO2 hop extract has about 57% uh, alpha acids, Liskey has none, okay? It's all been converted into Rho. Again, the beta concentrations are similar and uh, the oil concentration is a little bit lower with Liskey. And the reason for some of these lower numbers is primarily due to the fact that um, when we make the Rho product, um, we have a little entrapped water and that uh, dilutes the uh, concentration of some of these active ingredients. Now we'll talk about one of our aroma products uh, called Beta Aroma Extract. What is Beta Aroma Extract? Beta Aroma Extract is CO2 hop extract which has all the alpha acids removed. So there's no bittering in these products, okay? And the, as a result of the removal of the alpha acids, we get an enrichment of the hop oil. So the oil is increased to 12 to 15% by weight. And again, uh, these products are typically added late in the boil. So you can contribute some basic hop aroma to your beer. It also can help improve mouthfeel. Uh, because there's no vegetative matter, you can increase your beer yield. And uh, some brewers also uh, add this product uh, in the Whirlpool as well. And one of the other interesting uh, properties of this product is it could be added actually at the very beginning of the boil uh, as an antifoam. So if you have an issue with that cappuccino effect taking place at the very beginning of your boil, you can add uh, some beta aroma extract and that'll uh, knock the aroma down, or knock that foam down. We make another hop kettle uh, aroma product uh, called Aroma Extract. Aroma Extract is basically our beta aroma extract product, except we've removed most of the beta acids. And so what does this do for us? It further enriches the oil concentration, all right, from about 25% to 45%. Again. It's used in the same way as beta aroma extract. It's added late in the boil or in the whirlpool. Uh, it adds basic hop aroma to your beer, but it doesn't add any bitterness. And again, there's no vegetable material. And again, it has many of the same properties as beta aroma extract in terms of stability, storage, and, uh, and shelf life. We'll now talk about some of our isomerized post-fermentation hop products, our ISO extract 30%. So what is ISO extract 30%? It's simply a 30% solution of iso alpha acids uh, formulated as a potassium salt in water. And so it's pure iso alpha acids. There's little to no hop oil in this product. There's no beta acids, there's no alpha acids, it's just pure iso alpha acids. And so, these products are typically added post-fermentation for bitterness adjustment. And so one PPM of iso alpha acid added to the beer will contribute about one IBU of organolectic bitterness. Uh, the utilization is very high, usually 80 to 90% of the iso alpha acids that you add to your beer will get in the beer. So very efficient. And it can be used as a partial replacement for upstream hopping.
We'll now talk a little bit about light struck flavor. Uh, for the longest time, brewers knew there was something in beer that caused it to be light struck, meaning uh, it would get skunky. Uh, in fact, the first written uh, reference about this was in 1875, where uh, this uh, researcher in Germany said that beer is sensitive to light and should be packaged in dark containers to avoid skunky-like aroma. And he actually used the term light struck flavor. Uh, so that's the first time we've ever heard that term. But it wasn't until actually fairly recently, a couple of researchers at Curran uh, Research Labs, Curran Brewery in 1961, found that beer that was brewed with hops got light struck flavor. However, beer brewed without hops didn't. And so <clears throat> it only took them a couple of years to figure out it was actually the isoalpha acids in the beer that was responsible for the light struck character. And what is that light struck compound? It's, uh, the short term is MBT, and it stands for methylbutuene one file. So this is a mercaptan. So this is the chemistry that takes place when isoalpha acids uh, are exposed to light. And I should point out, this is just even visible light. Light from a light bulb will do this. And so essentially what happens is the isoalpha acids gets exposed to light and it forms this allylic radical. And uh, so here you have a double bond and the uh, carbon next to it is the allylic one. So you have an allylic radical. And then here you're forming a carbonyl radical. And when it comes to radicals, these are fairly stable. In most cases, the, these, these compounds goes, goes back, but in a very, very small amount of cases, this uh, carbonyl radical further gets converted into um, this allylic radical, which can react with sulfur to form your, uh, your mercaptan, okay? And uh, where does it get the sulfur? From uh, protein in your beer. So like proteins like uh, cysteine have a thiol group, which can easily get plucked. And so this uh, mercaptan uh, is, you can smell it uh, in the parts per trillion level. And so how fast does this reaction take place? It takes place in hours, in hours. So if you have a six pack of beer sitting in, you know, in green bottles or clear bottles, and it's sitting on a grocery store shelf with light on it, it'll take as little as eight hours for that beer to start to get skunky. And certainly within 24 hours, it gets light struck. That's how fast um, this reaction goes. Oh, and it doesn't matter if the beer is cold or warm, it still, still takes place. So once it was realized that isoalpha acids were responsible for the light struck character that takes place when beer is exposed to light, uh, a couple of smart uh, hop chemists at Miller Brewing Company uh, took some CO2 hop extract uh, they isolated the uh, alpha acids and isomerized it to form isoalpha acids. And then they treated it, the isoalpha acids, with sodium borohydride. And what that, what sodium borohydride does is it reacts with carbonyl groups, okay, and converts them into alcohols, okay? And so this is uh, the rho isoalpha acid that I was talking about earlier. And so this was the very first light stable hop acid ever made. Then uh, a couple of researchers realized if we hydrogenate the isoalpha acids with palladium catalyst, all right, and hydrogen gas, we can reduce these two double bonds and add four hydrogens uh, to these two double bonds and produce tetrahydro isoalpha acids, okay? And if you produce uh, tetrahydro isoalpha acids and treat it with sodium borohydride, you can again reduce the carbonyl group here and form hexahydro isoalpha acids. So what's really interesting is these three hop acids are all light stable. These two hop acids are foam enhancing and all four of these hop acids are bitter, but they have a different bitterness uh, a flavor associated with them. And I'll talk about that in a short while. So now we'll talk about these uh, reduced hop products in a little bit more detail. So I mentioned that <clears throat> all these hop acids have a different bitterness profile associated with them. When I talk about isoalpha acids, I usually re uh, mention that uh, it has a kind of a strong, harsh, all around the tongue type of bitterness. 
I mentioned earlier that roe has this smooth uh, kind of back of the tongue bitterness. And as I had mentioned uh, before, uh, with humulonones, humulonones are about two thirds as bitter as isoalpha acids and so is roe. Roe is about two thirds as bitter and they have the same bitterness profile as humulonones. Tetrahydroisoalpha acid, one ppm contributes about one IBU of organolectic bitterness. And tetra has kind of a sharp upfront non-lingering bitterness. And hexa has kind of a harsh all around the tongue type of bitterness as well. And so we did a project uh, many years ago with a uh, large brewer who wanted to put his beer in a clear bottle, but he wanted to have the same bitterness profile of that of isoalpha acids. And what we found was that if we use seven parts rho, one part tetra, one part hexa, we can get a beer that has a bitterness profile similar to isoalpha acids, but it's light stable and had better foam and lacing than his regular beer. So as I mentioned, uh, rho is produced by treating isoalpha acids with sodium borohydride. So we're adding two hydrogen atoms. This makes rho resistant uh, to that light struck flavor. Rho is not foam enhancing, but it does have a nice smooth non-lingering bitterness. And the product, as you can see here, is formulated as a 35% solution as a potassium salt uh, formulated in water. Again, the product is typically added post-fermentation and you can use it in concentrations up to 20 parts per million, uh, if not more. But um, it's primarily used to smooth out the bitterness of your beer and it can even be used in a beer that's not light stable. Uh, if you feel that you have a beer that's got kind of a harsh bitterness, you can reduce some of your kettle hopping and uh, use some of this row product to smooth out the bitterness of your beer. Tetra, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, the hydrogenation of isoalpha acids using uh, hydrogen gas and palladium on carbon catalysts. And again, here we're adding four hydrogens, hence the name Tetra. Again, it's light struck flavor resistant, it's foam enhancing, and it enhances also the lacing of your beer. Uh, again, Tetra is, uh, gives a upfront non-lingering bitterness. It's formulated as a 10% potassium salt solution in water. And uh, again, uh, it can be used up to concentrations of about 10 ppm, but for foam and lacing, uh, you can use as little as four to five parts per million. And again, keep in mind that for every ppm of Tetra you add, you're gonna be adding about one IBU of organoleptic bitterness. So here you could see uh, beers that were treated with uh, a controlled beer with three, 10 and 20 ppm of row. And this is what the foam uh, and lacing looks like after 10 minutes. And again, here's a zero, three, 10, 20 ppm of Tetra after 10 minutes. And as you can see with Tetra, you get much better foam and lacing uh, than you would get. Uh, with uh, a product like Rho. We also make a uh, hexa product, hexahydroisoalpha acid. Again, this is where we take the Tetra product and treat it with sodium borohydride. So we're adding two more hydrogens to the Tetra molecule. And this is light resistant. Again, it's foam enhancing, kind of has a harsh uh, side of the tongue type of bitterness. And uh, we also, and so it's formulated as a 10% solution in water, but we also have a 5% hexa and 5% tetra product. And this is kind of a nice product that has a nice uh, kind of mixed uh, bitterness profile associated with it. And, um, and again, uh, this product is typically added uh, up to 10 ppm in beer. Although if you need it for just foam enhancement, you can use as little as four to five ppm of this product to enhance the foam and lacing uh, of your beer. So just to review, um, when it comes to these uh, three reduced hop acids, uh, Rho is not used for foam enhancing, whereas Tetra and Hexa are. All three are light stable. Again, the bitterness uh, intensity is uh, only about 70% of that of ISO when it comes to Rho, has the same bitterness intensity as ISO, and uh, the Hexa is almost as bitter as uh, ISO. And again, the usage is for making uh, light stable beers, but also non-light stable beers for smoothing out the bitterness. 
Uh, Tetra is typically used for light stable beers or for just enhancing the foam and lacing of regular hop beers. And the same thing with uh, Hexa. Uh, it can be used for making light stable beers or for improving the uh, foam and lacing of regular hop beers. So how do we add these post-fermentation uh, bitter hop products? Uh, ideally, um, you like to dose the products into a pump where you have lots of mixing or in the turn of a pipe where you have a lot of turbulence. And so if uh, you're using a product like this, this, it's usually packaged in a 20 kilo plastic pail. Again, you can add uh, uh, your uh, a metering pump. Usually we recommend a metering pump that can uh, dose about 100 mils to one liter per minute, okay? Um, your tubing needs to be very small. Uh, we recommend tubing with an inner diameter of six to eight millimeters. And then you want a dip tube, okay? That's gonna go into the, the beer line. And again, the dip tube needs to be quite small, again, with an inner diameter of about three to five uh, millimeters. When it comes to post-fermentation hop addition, these are the ideal conditions. Now, I know some brewers can't meet these conditions, but these are the ideal ones. So the first thing we recommend is to, to, to do not dilute the product, okay? Use the product as is, okay? If you can, dose into clear, water-rectified beer, okay? You want to ideally dose over 90% of the beer transfer time. And again, if, um, <clears throat> if you uh, have a mass flow meter, that would be ideal. Uh, what a mass flow meter does is it allows your metering pump to dose the hop product faster during the beer transfer time. A lot of times when you're transferring beer, especially right after filtration, the beer is flowing very fast initially and then it starts to slow down as the filter starts to get uh, uh, plugged up. So a mass flow meter will dose the product based on the beer flow rate. And so you, if you wanna add, let's say four PPM of Tetra, it'll make sure every liter of beer gets four PPM of Tetra. You also wanna make sure that the yeast counts are fairly low. Um, if you have high yeast counts, uh, the hop acid could absorb to the yeast and so your utilization will go down. And you also want to uh, dose your hop products before any kind of chill proofing agents or absorbents. And you don't have to be that far upstream from uh, those chill proofing agents and absorbents, uh, only about five meters or so. Uh, the hops go in quite, quite quickly. And so once they're in solution, uh, they stay in solution. And we always recommend adding these products uh, before final filtration or before a polishing filter. There's always a chance you can introduce a slight amount of haze when adding these products. So to ensure that you, that haze is filtered out, always add these products before uh, final filtration. And then also what you like to do is uh, keep a little pressure on the receiving tank. And again, uh, this is to minimize any kind of foaming when the beer is transferred from one tank to the next. Hope you like that one. Okay. Common mistakes. Uh, I've done lots of trials uh, with brewers uh, post-fermentation and i always surprised when I see what some people are doing. Um, dip tube. Uh, sometimes they don't even have one or the tubing is way too big or the pumps are too big. So these are common mistakes. So try to make sure you have a dip tube and that you're using the right tube inner diameter and get a nice small metering pump. The product is dosed into beer containing absorbents, whether that's DE or PVPP. Again, make sure that the beer is clear and there's no absorbents. Also make sure that the uh, yeast counts are low, all right? You don't wanna be dosing into beer with yeast counts over five million cells per mil. And again, uh, add the beer ideally over 90% of the beer transfer time. Don't add it uh, to the beer too quickly. Also avoid dosing the product near carbon dioxide. Uh, if you dose near CO2, as the CO2 enters the beer, you have a, uh, a uh, temporary drop in pH because CO2 is a little acidic and that drop in pH 
will cause the hop acids to become less soluble. So again, hop acids are more soluble at higher pHs. And uh, don't mix the hop product with your diatomaceous earth slurry. I saw a brewery do that once and uh, yeah, their yields were very, very poor. I think they were less than 10%. And uh, again, don't add after your final filter or polishing filter, okay? And uh, again, uh, try to keep pressure on the tank receiving the beer because uh, if there's no pressure, you can get a lot of foaming and that foaming is your hop acids sticking to the sides of the walls and uh, you might lose a, a fair amount of uh, hop acids uh, due to the foaming, foam sticking to the sides of the walls. So often I have brewers tell me, well, I can't do exactly what you're recommending. And so I've gone through what a lot of people do and uh, this is the results they kind of see. So again, I know a lot of brewers that will add these products to the kettle because they just don't want to mess around with post-fermentation hopping. So if you do, these are the kind of utilizations you can expect. 65 to 70% for the ISO, 50 to 55% for the Rho, the Tetra, 20 to 25%, and the Hexa, 20 to 25%. This is probably the most common dosing point for a lot of large brewers because a lot of large brewers, they only do kiesel gore filtration and after that it's over. So because you have to add these products before filtration, these are the kind of results you can get. So as I mentioned here, again, the utilization is good with um, the ISO, uh, the rows a little bit better here. Again, the Tetra and Hexa go up quite a bit, okay, up to 50 to 55%, all right. And then here, these are the kind of utilizations you can get in water rectified beer, okay? Again, uh, 85 to 90% with the ISO, 75 to 85% with the row, uh, 65 to 85% uh, for the uh, Tetra and for the Hexa, okay? Uh, the primary reason for this range here, 65% versus 85%, um, could be due to the gravity of the beer. Okay, and how well you're dosing of the product. Uh, finally, if you're dosing the product post fermentation and it contains absorbance or high yeast counts, again, the yields drop significantly, as you can see here, about 20 to 35 percent in all these applications. So, just to kind of summarize, uh, alpha extract is usually used to enhance the foam and lacing of low IBU beers. Uh, it is uh, not bitter and it's not light stable uh, and it's very antimicrobial. Uh, just so you know, alpha acids can inhibit bacteria growth at concentrations as low as two parts per million. Uh, ISO extract 30% is generally used for adjusting bitterness. It's not light stable and it's also very antimicrobial. And just so you know, ISO alpha acids can inhibit gram positive bacteria at concentrations as low as eight parts per million. Row ice alpha acids are light stable. Um, they're uh, used for bittering and uh, they are antimicrobial, but at around eight, at about 10 to 12 parts per million. And then uh, Tetra and Hexa are both light stable. They're both very good at enhancing the foam and lacing of beer. And uh, both hop acids will inhibit uh, gram positive bacteria growth at concentrations of four parts per million. So they're twice as antimicrobial as uh, isoalpha acids. So in conclusion here, um, when it comes to um, uh, bittering, okay, our traditional products like CO2 hop extract, Ike Pike, Lisky, Iso extract, Tetra, and Hexa and Rho. When it comes to our flavor and aroma products, Again, you still have these same uh, bittering products like CO2 hop extract, but also beta aroma extract, aroma extract, and hop oils. And then uh, when it comes to foam enhancing products, again, we have the alpha extract, uh, the tetra, and the hexa. And again, all your bittering hop compounds uh, are antimicrobial, uh, including uh, a product that we make called beta bio 45%. And this is just a 45% solution of beta acids. And uh, 
For some craft brewers, uh, the reason uh, you might be interested in some of these products, if you're doing yeast propagation at your brewery, which a lot of brewers do, uh, you can add one or more of these hop products uh, to your yeast tank, and that'll help inhibit the gram-positive uh, bacteria growth uh, during yeast propagation. Uh, a lot of brewers like using this beta bio, uh, primarily because it's not gonna contribute any bitterness. Um, it's relatively inexpensive, and uh, because the beta acids are generally insoluble in beer, uh, it won't get into your final beer, so it won't affect your bitterness at all or flavor. And with that, uh, we'd be happy to uh, end this presentation and uh, take your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John Paul. Appreciate the uh, presentation and good information. So we've got some questions here. Uh, let's go ahead and start off. Uh, first question, are there any issues with mixing Tetra and Alpha? Um, no. Uh but usually uh, people will use one or the other. Um, I'm not sure if you'd get any benefit by mixing the two, um, but um, there would be no problem in doing it. Uh, okay. Uh, next question. Uh, are the fining agents, example of biofine, considered to be an absorbent when relating uh, to using uh, hop products? Can it be dosed along something like biofine? Yeah, I assume that's an enzyme? No, it's a fining agent. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, then it, you'd want to dose it uh, before, before that or after it's been removed. Okay. Is aroma extract variety specific? Normally it's not. Uh, so it's just a kind of a generic uh, hop aroma that you get using that product. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that the downstream products can be added to the kettle with lower efficiencies. What other um, impact would you have, adverse impact of using downstream products in the kettle? That's probably really the only one. Um, is just lower efficiency. Um, there, there aren't any other negative consequences I can think of. Um, cause these hop products are actually very, very thermally stable. Um, uh, so they can take the heat of the boil. Uh, so yeah. Uh, what would you expect the impact, um, with, uh, fermentation when you're using something like Tetra in the kettle as far as over foaming? Yeah, you would get a lot of, uh, over foaming. Yeah. In the kettle. Yeah. And that's why you're util and that's why the utilization is so poor because um, those who don't know uh, uh, foam is a, is a complex uh, between uh, hop acids and protein okay and so like if you pour yourself a beer and you get a nice foam ahead on there and you take your finger and you grab some of that foam and taste it you'll find that that foam is a lot more bitter than the beer itself and it's because again the, the hop acids get pulled up into the foam. And so during fermentation, if you have a foam enhancing hop product like Tetra in there, you know, the walls of your fermenter are going to be laced with all that Tetra on there. And so you're going to lose, that's why you're losing so much in terms of utilization. Plus Tetra is fairly nonpolar. It will probably preferentially stick to the yeast more than isoalpha acids or, or rho. Okay. What is the relative antimicrobial properties of beta compared to iso, rho, tetra, and hexa? Yeah, I didn't mention it. Uh, beta acids are extremely antimicrobial. Um, under laboratory conditions, uh, beta can inhibit bacteria growth at about a half a ppm up to one ppm. And um, alpha acids is two ppm. Tetra and hexa is four ppm and ISO is 8 ppm. Okay. Uh, next question, are these products available around the world? Yeah. Yep, uh, we manufacture, uh, as I mentioned, <clears throat> our two major manufacturing facilities are in Germany and the US, 
and we have plants that are very, very similar. So almost all the products we make in the US, we also make in Germany, but then we also ship these products to virtually every uh, country on the planet, you know, that makes beer. So. Okay. Uh, what is the shelf life of these downstream products? Oh, they're excellent, excellent. Um, I'll have to double check. We have a, uh, I think it might even be on our webpage, but um, I think we give like six year shelf life for almost all these products. Um, with Tetra and Hexa, I think we give a two year uh, best before shelf life, but that's primarily because those products can sometimes precipitate and fall out of solution over time. So if you use them within two years, they should be still in solution. Uh, but, uh, but chemically speaking, uh, they're rock stable. Um, the iso alpha acids, uh, they're the, that's the only 30% the iso product. That's the only product we recommend uh, that it be stored refrigerated because the iso alpha acids will slowly uh, uh, degrade over time. But again, if stored refrigerated, uh, it'll last um, a very long time. Uh, you know, again, another two to three years or something like that. And the same thing with our alpha extract, that should be stored cold. And uh, we have a two year best before uh, for that product. And as far as the uh, beta aroma or beta acids, um, beta, or our beta bio product, that's got a six year shelf life. And again, the CO2 hop extracts and the beta aroma extracts and the aroma extracts, I think those have, again, like a, a six year best before date. So they're very, very stable. So are those dates, uh, assuming you don't open the container? Uh, what yeah, it's, you always best to, um, it's always best to, once you open up a container, to use uh, that, that product uh, right away. Um, so uh, yeah, you don't want to keep partial containers for you know, months or, or years. You, know, you really want to use them within a, a few days or a, a couple of weeks. Kind of depends on the product, but yeah. So when you're resealing a container, would you recommend purging the headspace with nitrogen or uh, what kind of storage conditions? Yeah, you could do that. You certainly don't want to be purging it with CO2. Um, I was at a brewery once uh, that was dosing some hop products and uh, they had an open tank and it was in the cellar. So there was a lot of enriched CO2 in the air. And what they were, what we actually found, we did a little simple experiment. We actually took a, a sample of the Tetra and put it in a beaker. We measured the pH and it was something like nine and a half. And then like a couple hours later, we went and checked it and it dropped to eight and a half. And so the CO2 actually will react with the uh, potassium hydroxide in the product and, and convert it to potassium bicarbonate, which buffers at a pH of about seven and a half. So that was what was going on. So yeah, I purge it with uh, nitrogen if you got it and, uh, or just use it uh, right away. Okay. So why does uh, row 30% or 35% precipitate out? And it's a different color in cold temperatures. Yeah, and that's a challenge with that product is that um, it, um, it's got three hydroxy groups on it. And so essentially what we believe is taking place is those molecules will just kind of line up in hydrogen bond and then it just ends up forming these crystal structures and uh, the product falls out of solution uh, at, you know, due to that. But if you warm the product up to 55, if you have that problem, you can warm the product up to 55, 60 degrees uh, centigrade and it'll all go back into solution. Okay. Uh, this question here, uh, they're thanking you for the talk. They had a question about the size of breweries and uh, hop extracts that are recommended uh, would that apply to all breweries or just the large ones or mid-size? And, oh, uh, no, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of craft brewers uh, that uh, use uh, like hop extract, CO2 hop extract, and even the uh, very small ones. This is why some of the very small ones also like the uh, hop flow. Uh, if they can't use, usually I think our smallest uh, package uh, for CO2 hop extract is 150 grams of alpha, okay? But if you use less than that, then you can use a product like HopFlow and where you can just pour out, let's say you only need 100 mils of extract or let's say 50 grams of alpha. You could uh, you know, use a, a product like HopFlow if you're on that very small side. So. Right, right. And also uh, for the smaller craft brewers that are 
that have 10 or 15 barrel brew houses, the aroma extract and beta aroma extract are extremely popular additions for the Whirlpool for uh, hop forward beers to give you that hoppy character without contributing the vegetative matter for the true. So uh, yeah, the best thing is check with your uh, sales rep and, and uh, uh, find out you know, what hop products are available in the different sizes. Uh, yeah. Next question. Um, you mentioned the uh, adding uh, downstream products uh, to avoid carbonation. Do you have a recommended um, number of feet that the downstream products can be added either before or after the carbonating arm? Yeah, I'd say about probably five, uh, five meters uh, either way is always a good, uh, good Good distance. Okay. Uh, what are the typical yields expected uh, when you're doing the reduction of iso alpha acids using borohydride and uh, taro, and also doing the hydrogenation using palladium? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we're actually very good at um, doing these reductions and um, I believe our row reduction yields are around 85 to 90 percent, and uh, our tetra is even better than that. So, okay. Uh, another question here: uh, the even though the efficiency is lower, adding tetra to the uh, DE dosing tank, mm -hmm. uh, what other negative effect is there of doing that? Yeah, what ends up happening is, again, tetra and all hop acids are very good chelators, and they're also very nonpolar. And so if you mix uh, hop acids with diatomaceous earth, and I was, like I said, at a brewery that they actually did that, you know, it was almost like they were dosing no hop product. They, their yields were very low. About They only got about 10% of the product in. Uh, I'm trying to think of why someone would want to try to do that unless they only have one pump to dose and and that's the only way they can get it in. You're probably better off actually in terms of yield and efficiency is to just simply add it to the brew kettle or the whirlpool. Okay. The, uh, the aqueous solutions of ISO, Rho, or Tetra have a pH of eight to 10 or 11. What happens if pH is higher? Well, you don't want to go too, too, too high. Um, it's not necessary. And uh, you could cause the molecule to degrade. Uh, tetra and Rho could probably take it, but your iso will degrade. Uh, your iso alpha acids will degrade. But the, the Rho, Tetra, and Hexa, they're stable enough. They can take a higher pH, but there really isn't any reason to, to uh, have the pH go up that high. Um, so, but. okay. Okay, well, that uh, pretty well wraps up the list of questions that we have. I uh, really appreciate the uh, responses. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Darren. Yeah, thank you so much, Mike and Dr. May. Yeah, that wraps it up for today's webinar and our series of Hoppy Topics. Our next presentation will be right here at the same time next week with Dr. Christina Smith discussing the awesome dry hopping potential of Eureka. As always, our links and recordings can be found by visiting the customer portal page on our website. If additional questions or comments come up, feel free to email us directly. Once again, my name is Darren. Thanks for joining us and happy brewing.